Coming up on Doctype, what should be on your homepage? We'll break it down and show you how to make it click. Then, cross-site request forgery. Learn how to lock it up and protect your site from this common security threat. So pour yourself a sandwich and make some iced tea because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by Scrum and Barcamp Orlando. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that wants to learn a little bit of coding or a developer that thinks everything they make looks like crap, Doctype is here to show you the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help you take your next project to the next level. So if you're watching this and it's Tuesday morning, we'll actually be in Miami for FOA. That's right. We're probably in the Colony Theater right now, barring any flat tires or disasters. So if you're at the Colony Theater, you should stop by. And if you're and sitting behind hello. us, just poke it. Just yeah. throw something at us. Yeah, just poke us. <laughs> anyway, this episode, we're going to be talking about homepage design and cross-site request forgery. Let's get into it. So what goes into a homepage? Well, ideally, not a whole lot. You want to keep the homepage as decluttered as possible. This is easier said than done because everyone's going to want something different on the homepage, whether it's the business people, the marketing people, or even the web designers. Now, as a web designer, it is your job to try and fight that and keep the homepage as decluttered as possible. The question to ask yourself when designing the homepage is, what are the goals of the site? What do you want the user to watch or buy or do next? This is impossible to predict really, but if you keep this goal in mind throughout, it'll help you make decisions. Next, you need to consider a goal of a different kind, and that is the goal of new visitors versus returning visitors. Amazon.com does a tremendous job of facilitating both. On their homepage, they have a large image for a promotion for new visitors, and for returning visitors, they have product recommendations. You have to figure out what do new visitors want and what do returning visitors want. Oftentimes, it's a good idea to create a very different layout for the homepage versus the rest of the site. This is because the goals of the homepage are often really different from the site's content, and you want to have something that's going to direct users to the content they want more quickly. Also keep in mind that the homepage might be a user's first impression of your branding, so it's important to have you know, the logos, the color, your message, and other pertinent information. Lastly, you want to make sure that you have a call to action button that takes users to the next step. In the case of the new Doctype homepage, we have large clickable areas that take users to the latest episode. Your homepage has to answer three questions. Where am I? Why should I stay? And why should I come back? The most important thing on the homepage is the copy. By writing clear, easy to understand copy, you can answer all these questions in just a sentence or two. For example, on the new Doctype homepage, we have the tagline, the show for people who make websites. Even if you don't know anything about web design, this gives you a little bit of an idea of what the site is about. Then in smaller text, it says new episode every Tuesday. This gives the viewer a reason to come back. Now, when we come back, Jim is gonna be talking about cross-site request forgery. If you're working on projects, you want to stay organized and make sure you're working on the right things. That's where Scrum can help. Scrum uses Scrum methodology to help you plan your work and make sure you keep on delivering. Drag and Drop Everywhere makes quick work of adding releases, sprints, user stories, and tasks. Scrum also allows you to designate your product owner, your Scrum master, and your Scrum team members, and it brings full transparency to all your projects. Get started for free with the Indie Plan over at scrummed.com. This week, we're taking a look at a popular exploit that you should be protecting your users from. When building web applications, security must be a top concern in order for our users to trust our services. Typically, web applications will employ a login system based on cookies. While this adds a layer of security, there are several attack strategies that attempt to circumvent it. In episode 3 of Doctype, we looked at the cross-domain policies of Ajax and browsers. This week, we're going to take a look at an attack known as the Cross-Site Request Forgery, or CSRF. Most login schemes rely on cookies to remember which account a browser is logged into. This is usually pretty secure because browsers won't share cookie information from one site to another. Most attacks focus on getting the cookie itself or getting a browser that has a valid cookie to perform actions on the attacker's behalf. We are going to use Twitter in our examples, but Twitter has already put into place the precautions we're about to show you. In our example, I will try to make a tweet from Nick's Twitter account. Nick will have recently logged into Twitter and will have an active session in his browser. Imagine the URL for creating a tweet were accessible through a GET request. For instance, the URL twitter.com slash update, and we pass the status that we want to post. 
One conceivable way I can make a tweet from Nick's account is to send him an email with a URL I have created to make the tweet, and some text that will entice him to click it. Hopefully Nick won't be cautious enough to review the URL before he clicks it, because when he does, he'll make a request to Twitter to update his status. And because his browser has an active session, it will go through. He will also probably notice that he's on Twitter and then he made an update and he'll delete it. But here is why it's so important that any action you have that has side effects is only accessible through post requests. Instead of getting him to click a link directly to Twitter, I could create a page with a URL inside of an image tag. When he views the page, the browser will make a GET request to Twitter to try to fetch the image. It'll send all the Twitter cookies along with it so it'll be authenticated and it will update a status. Nick will be none the wiser, the only evidence that this happened is a broken image tag that could be easily hidden. Link tags, scripts, and image tags will only make GET requests, so if you make all of your important actions only accessible through POST requests, you are protecting yourself from this type of attack. Just refusing GET requests doesn't protect you fully. My malicious page could have just as easily created a form with Twitter as the action, POST as the method, and the fields as hidden inputs, and submitted it through JavaScript. It would be a POST request coming from Nick's browsers with Nick's credentials and would have created the tweet successfully. To protect against this attack, we want to create a secret value, an authenticity token, that an attacker could not possibly guess. We then put that value as a hidden field in our legitimate forms. When we process our forms, we check for that authenticity token, and if it's missing or invalid, we discard the request. When we generate our authenticity token, we want to ensure three things. It is impossible for the attacker to predict. It is unique to the user, and it will not change from one request to another for a given user. A common approach is to hash a piece of information unique to the user and not easily discovered by the attacker. For instance, a session ID is ideal since it's already pretty random and it's concealed from the outside world. You could also salt this hash with some secret string to make it more difficult to spoof the hash. When you check the authenticity token, you just need to check that the token sent is the same as the one you can calculate yourself. Now that an attacker cannot figure out a valid authenticity token, he cannot trick another browser into making another request by crafting his own form. The code we showed you will do the trick, and it's pretty easily implemented in any language. If you're using a framework, it may already have this functionality built in. For instance, both Rails and Django both have middleware to check your post requests and helpers to create your authenticity tokens. Check out the show notes at doctype.tv for more information. If you've never been to a Barcamp event, then Barcamp Orlando is a must. It's an all-day event where the attendees are also the presenters. Before the day gets rolling, anyone can post a presentation topic to the big board with a time and place to go see it. Then, you get to pick the presentations that you want to go see. If this is your first Barcamp, we strongly encourage that you present. And you can talk about anything you want, from technology to art or even just washing your cat. Barcamp Orlando starts at 9 a.m. on April 3rd, 2010, here at Wall Street Plaza in downtown Orlando. To learn more, check out barcamporlando.org. Org. That's it for this week. Be sure to let us know what you think in the comments. Also, check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype TV on Twitter. Also, if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of Doctype, send us an email at questions at doctype.tv. And if you subscribe by RSS or iTunes, you'll never miss an episode of Doctype. So until next Tuesday, remember that every great web page starts with Doctype.